Hi, everyone. This is session two in the Power of Godly Character, and we've called it Talking with God Prayer. And so uh, this is a one-way dialogue, so this is just listen to the topic and then, and then the study. So this is about 35 minutes. So Talking with God, Power of Prayer. When we're getting to know one another as friends, the best way of building the relationship is through lots of talking together. And as disciples of Jesus, we are developing a friendship with God. And so lots of talking together is the best way to get to know him. And that involves a two-way conversation, talking to him and making time for him to reply. In this session, we want to look at what prayer really is how we can hold a conversation with God and how we can hear him speaking to us. And this will be an exciting session as we find out that God really desires to talk with us. As we talk with God, we need to give him opportunity to talk to us too. The definition of talking with God slash prayer. We may have grown up with some fuzzy ideas about what prayer is. We might have thought of it as pleading with God to try and twist his arm because he's unwilling to grant what we desire. We might have thought of prayer as coming to God with our spiritual shopping list and presenting that before him. Or some of us may think that we have to pray in a particular place and in a particular way. What we want to do is leave behind these preconceived ideas and find out from what the find out what the Bible tells us about talking with God. Let's remember right at the outset that talking with God is essentially a two-way conversation. It's not a religious duty, but something that is most enjoyable as we pray as we spend time together. For, and so for a start, let's look at how God sees us. In Jeremiah 29, verses 11 to 14, God says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. And in those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me in earnest, you will find me when you seek me. I'll be found by you, says the Lord. God loves us. He does not see us as a failure. His plans for us are good, even beyond what we can imagine in our wildest dreams. He wants us to express our love to him, and he wants to express his love to us too. He has promised to listen to us, and we will find him if we are really serious about spending time with him. When two people really love one another, they look into each other's eyes as they seek a response of love from each other. And it's amazing how much God, it's amazing how much can be read in another person's face. If, a face, sorry. In Psalm 28, Day, uh, David says, My heart has heard you. Come and talk with me. And my heart responds, Lord, I am coming. God loves and wants to talk with us face to face. He's actually inviting us to come and talk with him. And prayer is really a willing response from our heart to God's heart. Seeking his face brings forth his re ready response of love toward us. So first, let's look at how we talk with God. One time, Jesus' disciples saw him talking with his father, and that's his heavenly father, as we've just read in Psalm 27 eight. He was enjoying his father's presence as he talked heart to heart with him. So they asked Jesus how they could pray and enjoy the same two-way conversation with God. And Luke 11, chapter one, sorry, cha Luke chapter 11, verse 1 says, once when Jesus had been out praying, one of his disciples came to him as he finished and said, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. So let's look at Jesus' instructions. As he took time to explain to his disciples 
what talking to God is about and gave them a model to follow as he continued to teach them. And in Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 to 8, Jesus said, And now about prayer, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I assure you, that is all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your heavenly Father or to your Father secretly. Then your Father, who knows all secrets, will reward you. When you pray, don't babble on and on as people of other religions do. They think their prayers are only answered by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them because your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. Jesus told them, that talking with God is not to be done so that it is seen and heard by the most people like the religious leaders in Jesus' day did. In that case, to whom were they talking to? Probably not to God. If prayer is from a personal relationship with God as our heavenly, as our heavenly Father, then the best place to be is where no one else can see us or hear what we are saying. It's between us and God. He's not interested whether we can put lots of words together in public. He's interested in what really comes from our heart in private and when we're alone with him. <clears throat> he, encourages us, he encourages us not to give up on talking with him. He promises that we will receive the answer as we persist. Let me just fix something. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 to 11, keep on asking and you'll be given what you ask for. Keep on looking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open. For everyone who, who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds and the door is open to everyone who knocks. You parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask it? The words ask, seek, and knock are all in the present continuous tense. That means we can come back to God again and again and he will not become weary of us. It's like a child who knows that he or she has free access to a father at any time. God loves to, go to give good things more than earthly fathers do. As we talk with God, expect to receive his promises. You will because he is so good. So now Jesus gives his disciples a prayer model. Not just to repeat word for word, but to use as a model. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 13, Jesus said, Pray like this, Our Father in heaven, may your name be honoured, may your kingdom come soon, may your will be done here on earth, just as it is in heaven. Give us our food for today, and forgive us our sins, just as we have forgiven those who have sinned against us. And don't let us yield to, to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So how are we to use this model? And there are seven basic keys that we can include as we talk with God. One, we can talk to God as our father. And that's verse nine. He's not some distant being. We are family members. And Jesus calls us to express our love and relationship with God as our heavenly father. Two, we can count on God's presence. That again is in, in verse nine, where Jesus says, hallowed be your name. And the word hallowed personalizes our thankfulness and establishes the importance of worshiping him first and foremost. We come into his presence as we praise him. Three, 
we can align ourselves with God's priorities. And your kingdom come is in verse 10. Seeing that we're now citizens of his kingdom, declare that his priorities shall be established in our lives. Give God permission to be our ruler, to be ruler in our lives right now. For as God's children, we can, can, can confidently ask for his provision for our daily needs. Give us this day, which is verse 11. Jesus says that we can ask God to meet our needs for this day. Tomorrow will look after itself and we will achieve nothing by worrying about how our needs will be met in the future. Five, ask God for forgiveness and forgive us our sins just as we're forgiven those, which is verse 12. He is very ready to forgive us, but we must choose to forgive others. God forgives in the measure we're prepared to forgive others. Six, claim God's power over Satan. Deliver us from the evil one, which is verse 13. Ask God for protection. And seven, acknowledge that God is in control of everything. For yours is the kingdom, which is verse 13. And we're in partnership with him to see his kingdom established here on earth. Praise God for sharing his kingdom and his power with us. Jesus never intended that his prayer be repeated parrot fashion, but that it was a model from which we take the keys and include them as we talk with God. We do not even, we do not even have to use all seven keys every time we pray, but they should be regularly included in our conversation with God. When people love each other, one of the things they most want to do is find out what the other person likes and wants and then to line up with that. It's the same as we develop our friendship with God. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, it says, and we can be confident that he will listen to us whenever we be asking for anything in line with his will. When we pray, we're not trying to manipulate God to do what we want. And that's how people who do not know God may see it. But as disciples of Jesus, we want to find God's will and come into agreement with it. What if we do not know his will? Well, ask him. He promised to tell us. And when we agree with his will, we can pray with authority and know that we will receive God's answers because he's already sent the answer on his way. How we talk with God. Let's apply what we've been looking to. When you're talking with God, use your ordinary language, not an artificial one for prayer you may have learned from someone earlier on. Think and speak the way you are. That's how God made you. And it is the way he accepts you just as you are. Mm. When a couple really love each other, they find all sorts of ways to communicate. When they are together, they can even communicate through their eyes without a word being spoken. They talk together a lot or they may have their own special language, which may not make sense to anyone but them. When they're away from each other, they will often write love letters to one another. And when we love God, we can do the same thing. We can just enjoy being in God's presence without saying too much. When we talk to him, he will talk back to us. And we can even use a special language that God gives us. And he understands that special love language perfectly. In the Bible, it's called tongues. We can talk with God using a special language. Sometimes our ordinary language is completely inadequate to express our heart fully to God. And that's where the Holy Spirit comes to help us pray and romans chapter 8 verse 26 says and the holy spirit helps us in our distress for we don't even know what we should pray nor how we should pray but the holy spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words the holy spirit does not pray instead of us he identifies with us and takes our inadequately expressed prayers and makes them effective. 
And one of the great ways that God helps us is that he has given us the gift of tongues so that we can express what otherwise would be impossible in our ordinary language. It's his good gift. So let's receive it and use it as we communicate with him. We can also communicate by writing to God. What person does not enjoy receiving and reading a love letter from the one he or she loves? We can even write God a love letter, and he loves to read it. And when we read the Psalms, we find that many of them are letters the psalmist wrote to God. And often, God replies in the same psalm as he helps the psalmist resolve the issues that were on his heart. So make it a daily habit of using a journal. Write a love letter to God that expresses who you are. He will write his love letter back to you as you allow him to use your page. It's not automatic writing. It's cooperating with him. And he will put his thoughts in your mind so that you can write them down in your, in your journal. And what a great way of letting him communicate his love to you. <clears throat> one of the great things about being with one, the one we love is that we can relax together. Time seems to fly and there's something good about just being with one another. And it's the same when we love God. We can relax in his presence and enjoy it. We can also rest in the knowledge that he is in control of everything and we have nothing to worry about. God hears and answers prayer. In Isaiah chapter 65, verse 24, God said, I will answer them before they even call to me. While they are still talking to me about their needs, I will go ahead and answer their prayers. God knows our need even before we express it. He is already sending the answer before we even call on him. A great illustration of this truth comes from the story of Nehemiah, who was serving in the palace of the king of Persia. Nehemiah's people, the Jews, were exiles in Persia, and Jerusalem was still in ruins after well over a century. Nehemiah had been asking the Lord to do something about it, and he was prepared to be part of God's answer to the situation. When he came before the king of Persia in his duty as a cupbearer, the king noticed he was sad. And that was dangerous because he could lose his life for being sad before the king. But God gave him favor with the king. And in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, it says this. The king asked, well, how can I help you? And with a prayer to the God of heaven, I replied, if it please your majesty, and if you please with me, your servant, send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. Nehemiah's prayer had hardly been framed in his mind when God answered and gave him the boldness and wisdom to ask the king to send him to Judah and rebuild Jerusalem. And the king granted him his request and gave him everything he needed. He even paid for what Nehemiah wanted to do. And that is how quickly and completely God answered what Nehemiah had been talking about with him. Let's now look at some of the ways of hearing God's, God's answers. As we've been saying, talking with God is a two-way conversation, and he loves to reply to us. And we need to have an ear that is tuned in to what he wants to say by way of reply. God can answer us in many ways. He is God, so there are no limits on how he can communicate with us as we talk with him. So let's look at some of the ways he'll reply to our conversation. One, through his word. God takes his written word, the Bible, and makes it speak to every situation in our lives. Jesus reveals this truth for us in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, and it says this. <clears throat> but Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say, 
People need more than bread for their life. They must feed on every word of God. Jesus was replying to one of the temptations of the devil during the 40 days he spent in the wilderness. When Jesus says on every word, he's not just referring to the whole of the Bible, but a particular portion of the Bible that he shines light upon so that it becomes the precise answer we're looking for or that speaks directly to the circumstances we're in. As we talk to God, we can expect that he will use a part of his written word as his direct word to us. And that's why it is important to read the Bible and store it up in our hearts by memorizing as much of it as we can. Two, God can speak to us in an audible voice. Even though we have the Bible today and we can hear God as we read it, let's not dismiss that sometimes God may speak to us audibly. So listen as I read an account of God speaking in an audible voice in Acts chapter 9, verses 10 to 17. And this is what it says. Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to me in a vision calling Ananias. Yes, Lord, the, the, he replied. And the Lord said, go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas. When you arrive, ask for Saul of Tars Tarsus. He is praying for me right now. I've shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying his hands on him so that he can see again. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I've heard about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And we hear that he's authorized by the leading priest to arrest every believer in Damascus. But the Lord said, go and do what I say, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for me. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me so that you may get your sight back and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Here's a two-way conversation between Ananias and the same Jesus who arrested Saul on the road to Damascus. It was obviously normal, excuse me. It was obviously normal for Ananias to talk with God and expect his reply. He talks out of his concerns about Saul. He had heard of, that this man was doing terrible things to the disciples. But Jesus settles his concerns as he replied to Ananias audibly. And immediately he obeyed what Jesus told him to do. The voice was so clear that we can still read the record of the conversation 2,000 years later. Three, God can speak, can, can speak while we sleep. We can even hear God clearly while we're asleep. That happened with a little boy called Samuel who lived over 1,000 years before Jesus was born on earth. And in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 to 10, it says this. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the boy Samuel was serving the Lord by assisting Eli. Now in those days, messages from the Lord were very rare and visions were quite uncommon. One night, Eli, who was almost blind by now, had just gone to bed. The lamp of God had not yet gone out and Samuel was sleeping in the tabernacle near the, near the ark of God. Suddenly the Lord called out, Samuel, Samuel. Yes, Samuel replied, what is it? And he jumped up and he ran to Eli. Here I am, what do you need? I didn't call you, Eli replied. Go on back to bed. So he did. Then the Lord called out again, Samuel. And again, Samuel jumped up and ran to Eli. Here I am, he said. What do you need? I didn't call you, my son, Eli said. Go on back to bed. So Samuel did not yet know the Lord because he'd never had a message from the Lord before. So now the Lord called a third time. And once more, Samuel jumped up and ran to Eli. Here I am, he said. What do you need? Then Eli 
realized it was the Lord who was calling the boy. So he said to Samuel, go and lie down again. And if someone calls you, calls again, say, yes, Lord, your servant is listening. So Samuel went back to bed and the Lord came and called as before. Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel replied, yes, your servant is listening. When we're asleep, God can speak to us very easily. Our conscious mind with all the distractions of the day does not get in the way and block out his voice. God speaks directly to our spirit, which is never sleep. Four, in dreams and visions. <clears throat> God can give us significant dreams or visions at night through which he speaks to us. The Apostle Paul had been asking God for direction about what the next step in his service for him was to be. He tried a number of alternatives, but the doors were all closed. God was the one who organized that. And so he found himself stuck in Troas on the west coast of Asia Minor, or modern Turkey, wondering what to do next. Acts chapter 16, verses 9 to 10, says this. That night, Paul had a vision. He saw a man from Macedonia, northern Greece, pleading with him, come over and help us. So we decided to leave for Macedonia at once, for we could only we could only conclude that God was calling us to preach the good news there. When the Holy Spirit chose to speak to Paul through a vision at night, he heard God's direction clearly. God had been renewing Paul's mind and so when he spoke to him in a vision, he had no doubt whose voice he had heard. God can speak in a voice of correction, and that's five. Whenever we get off the right track, God in his love gives us a correcting word. He always tells us what the right path is that we should be taking. In Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21, it says, And you will hear a voice saying, this is the way, turn around and walk here. The picture in this verse is of a self-willed donkey which is straying off the path. The donkey driver who walked behind him tells the donkey to get back on the path. And whenever we get off course, God gently tells us that we're going the wrong way and then directs us back onto the right course. He never leaves us wondering, what is the right way? He tells us. Six, there can also be an inner witness. Luke 2 tells of two people who have been asking God about when the Savior was to come. One was Simeon, and God told him that he would not die until he has seen the Lord's Christ. The other was Anna, who had been constantly praying about the same thing. And they were both in the temple at the right time, having been led there by the Holy Spirit. And as soon as they saw Joseph and Mary bringing in the child Jesus, they knew without a shadow of doubt that he was the one who was the answer to their prayers. That inner witness they had assured them that God had answered their prayers. Luke chapter 2, verses 36 to 38 says this. Anna a prophet who was also there in the temple. Sorry, I'll repeat that again. Anna, a prophet, was also there in the temple. She was the daughter of Phanuel, I think, of the tribe of Asher and was very old. She was a widow for her husband had died when they had been married only seven years. She was now 84 years old and she never left the temple but stayed there night and day worshipping God with fasting and prayer. And she came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Jesus, and she began praising God. She talked about Jesus to everyone who had been waiting for the promised king to come and deliver Jerusalem. Hmm. Others in Jerusalem also resonated with Anna's testimony. They also had that inner witness that Jesus was the one whom they had been praying for. We can also have that inner witness that God answered what we have been talking with him about. And that's why it's good 
to have a journal to record our conversations with God because we can look back on them and see how God answered. And it's worthwhile to write down the answers too. Then we can read them again and be reminded of how much God speaks to us. Seven, God can speak to us through prophecy. About 850 BC, King Jehoshaphat was facing the greatest threat he'd ever experienced. A great multitude of his enemies from across the Jordan River were plotting to invade Judah, and he faced incredible odds. He prayed to the Lord in his obedience to God's answer, brought about the greatest victory he'd ever seen. And there were three things that Jesseth, Jehoshaphat and Judah did that put them in the position where God could save them. One was fasting, which is verse 3. Two was prayer, which is verses 4 to 13. And three was praise, which is verse 21, 22. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 3 and 12 says this. Jehoshaphat was alarmed by this news and sought the Lord for guidance. He also gave orders that everyone throughout Judea, throughout Judah, should observe a fast. And verse 12 says, Oh, our God, won't you stop them? We are powerless against this mighty army that's about to attack us. We do not know what to do, but we're looking to you for help. Jehoshaphat called the people together to pray to the Lord in unity with him. All he could do was express his utter dependence on the Lord. The Lord answered King Jehoshaphat through the word of a prophet. And 2 Chronicles chapter 20 verses 13 to 18 says this. As all the men of Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, wives and children, the Spirit of the Lord came upon, upon one of the men standing there, and his name was Jehaziel, a Levite who was the descendant of Asaph. He said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat, listen, all of you people of Judah and Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army, for the battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow, march out against them. But you will not even need to fight. Take your positions, then stand still and watch the Lord's victory. He is with you, O people of Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Go out there tomorrow, for the Lord is with you. Then King Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to the ground, and all of the people of Judah and Jerusalem did the same worshipping the Lord. The prophetic word came as God's response to their desperate prayer. God reminded the people that it was his battle. All they needed to do was stand and watch what he would do. And that's verse 17. The king and the people all expressed their gratitude as they worshipped the Lord. And that's verse 18. As they faced this battle against incredible odds, the king encouraged the people to believe the Lord and his prophets, which is verse 20. And so they did. And the appointed singers went out in front of the army and they sang and praised the Lord. And he brought about a great victory that they did not have to fight for. The enemy fought amongst themselves. <clears throat> when we face hopeless situations, we can do the same as Jehoshaphat, and depend totally on God. The Lord can talk to us through a prophetic word that can be just as much a comfort as it was to Judah, as he said, do not be afraid or dismayed, for the battle is not yours but God's. And that's verse 15. So let's thank God when he speaks to us through prophecy. Eight, he speaks to us through worship. David knew that as he worshipped the Lord, he would hear God answer his prayers. And Psalm 34, verses 2 to 4 and 6 says this, I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are discouraged take heart. 
Come and let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. I prayed to the Lord and he answered me, freeing me from all my fears. And verse 6 says, I cried out to the Lord in my suffering and he heard me. He heard me. He set me free from all my fears. As we spend time worshipping the Lord, we will not rely so much on our own wisdom for answers or on our own efforts for results. We will put our trust in the Lord and depend on him completely. Then, as we see God moving on our behalf, we will naturally talk about him to anybody who will listen. Nine, he will use words of wisdom and knowledge. God will sometimes use coaches, church leaders, and others to give us his answers. And in 1 Corinthians 12, 8, it says this, to one person, the spirit gives the ability to give wise, to wise advice. To another, he gives the gift of special knowledge. Wise advice is God's answer to a specific situation that reveals his mind and will for this that, that situation. The gift of special knowledge is what someone led by the Holy Spirit may say about you or your situation that only God could know. And it would be impossible for the speaker to know it without being revealed to him or her by God. A word of wisdom or a word of knowledge can come through leaders or others sometimes even without their knowledge. But when it is a true word from God, that word will resonate in our spirit and we will know for sure that God has spoken to us. Ten, we can hear his word through God's love letters. We've already mentioned keeping a journal and allowing God to write back to you. And here's how someone describes it. Journaling is simply writing out our prayers to God and what I believe is his response to me. It's a diary of my two-way dialogue with God. We find Habakkuk, on the Old, an Old Testament prophet, doing just that. God tells Habakkuk to write down what he wants to ask and what he sees by way of God's answer. Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 1 to 3 says, I will climb up into my watchtower now and wait to see what the Lord will say to me and how he will answer my complaint. Then the Lord said to me, write my answer in large, clear letters on a tablet so that a runner can read it and tell everyone else. But these things I plan won't happen right away. Slowly, steadily, surely, the time approaches when the vision will be fulfilled. If it seems slow, Wait patiently, for it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. In your journal, in your journal, you can write down anything. Questions, dilemmas, thoughts about what you've read from the Bible, need for direction, etc. Write down any dreams you've had that are significant or personal events feelings, and so on. Write down everything in faith. Journaling keeps your mind engaged and makes it easier not to become distracted from God. It helps to give you greater focus as you talk with God. As you begin to journal, you will find that God replies to what you've written. As you develop the habit of journaling, you'll become more and more sensitive to what he wants to write to you. And another great thing you will notice is how is that God is much less judgment, judgmental than you may have expected him to be. And that's a great thought. Eleven, we know that God has spoken, spoken because he gives us confirmation. God can answer us as he organizes our life situations so that we walk in line with his will. And Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will direct your paths. When you're looking for confirmation, remember that God puts wise people around us, such as your coaches and leaders, who can hear from him. 
your safety is being accountable to them. And it's important that you develop the habit of seeking godly counsel from those you're accountable to. They can help you from going off course as you seek to obey God's directions in your lives. If you've heard God speak to you, check it out with them so that they can evaluate what you've heard and confirm that it is indeed from God. They can also help you with practical hints about how you may apply that word in your lives. As we conclude this session, let's remember that just as in the natural, relationship develops through regular communication. And our relationship with God develops just the same way. Spend quality time with him and not just the leftovers. Relax and enjoy the experience. Talk with God daily. Talk to him about anything. He's glad to listen and he'll respond to you. He will respond to you. Expect to hear from him and you will. He is a God who speaks. So, Father God, I just thank you for this session. I pray that these that people that listen to this will get revelations and insight and understanding that you're a God, that you're a loving God who wants to speak to us intimately, that wants to answer our prayers, that wants to give us direction and insight and understanding. And I pray, God, that this will be a blessing to those who hear this. Amen.